Good afternoon, everyone. 400 years cycle just with the grand solar minimum. Cinnabung awoke a few years ago on a 400 year cycle. Massive eruption pushing ash 15 kilometers, some say 17 kilometers, visible from satellites. Ash covering crops locally. This is going to spread into Southeast Asia. Dust veil index back to 1600 reads like a today's active volcano list. Looking at the most powerful eruptions of all time, the ones that sent us into global crop failures, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, just like we're seeing today, and then Iceland awakening, going back in time. Grand solar minimum fingerprint is a massive eruption that produces famine globally. 44 BC, Vesuvius 79, late antique little ice age, 600s, UN dynasty collapsing, 1280, spore minimum eruptions, Vanuatu, year without a summer, Dalton minimum, and it's all about the solar radiation declines as the ash enters our atmosphere. Looking what can happen in the last 70 years, the forcing, and what's the delay going to be on cooling regionally and crop losses across Southeast Asia with this eruption, this new grand solar minimum, our Earth needs to equalize its charge with the sun as it decreases its activity state, which means more tectonic activity, more violent volcanic eruptions, is my personal opinion. I believe this is it. The Earth is speaking to us. This volcanic eruption is the beginning of the cycle of a year without a summer. Our globe is not ready for even a 20% reduction in food output. And as we progress down the timeline of the Grand Solar Minimum, I'll continue to bring you information, so please subscribe to the channel and click the bell so you can get the latest updates. Knowing that we're entering a Grand Solar Minimum, and knowing that volcanic activity which creates global ash cover that reduces our crop yield, which leads to famine, is a fingerprint of the Grand Solar Minimum, some days you just wake up and say, oh, it can't be happening this quickly. This is the beginning of the cycle right here. The earth is talking to us. It's giving us the sign that this is the intensification, amplification point. And from this point forward, these eruptions are going to get more violent. And is it just coincidence that Cinnabung awoke just a few years ago after a 400-year slumber and our grand solar minimum timelines are on a 400-year cycle? This eruption has gone 17 kilometers into the atmosphere. This ash is going to spread. There will be regional crop losses in Southeast Asia and regional cooling. They've already had extreme cold across Bangladesh and other areas in Asia. This is going to extend the winter. Look for cooler temperatures regionally in Asia for sure from this eruption. It is massive. This is on every major news outlet. This is a major global eruption and they are downplaying it. What you see here on this is only the bottom one quarter of how high that ash cloud is extending up into our atmosphere. Beginning of the eruption and it just kept climbing. And just jump onto Twitter and put in the search bar there. Mount Cinnabung eruption. You're going to get dozens, dozens, dozens of feeds and photos. It is absolutely stunning and mesmerizing the power of nature. This is earlier in the day, the satellite photo. I'm curious what it'll look like as it spreads over the next few days. This was in the first few hours of the eruption. It didn't even reach totality in the height of the ash plume when they took this photo here. And the ash is already starting to fall out locally but you can see what's happening to the crops. This is gonna devastate Indonesia's Sumatran area crop production. This ash cloud will swing over into Malaysia slightly. Look for crop losses across Southeast Asia associated to this eruption. And the media will tell you otherwise right now, but let's move forward in time. They don't even know if this eruption's finished yet. The ring of fire is absolutely awakening over here in Asia. You got eruptions all the way from Papua New Guinea over in Indonesia. You got quakes all over the place running up through Taiwan. You got eruptions up in Japan. And then we just need to look at the dust veil index of major eruptions. This goes back to 1600. 
And if you look at the names on this, you're going to start to see an enormous amount of matchups from today's Magic Awakening Volcanoes on multi-century cycles. And on the right side, the DVI, the higher it is, the more ash you put up, the more of an effect it had on our atmosphere, and the more of an effect it had on our global food production. But when I look down and I see something at 2,300, and I just go right over and I say, my own, you mean that major erupting volcano that just started again in its cycle in the Philippines right now? That same one? Yes. We look at Katla. Iceland starting to get active in the north. Vesuvius awakening again. The string of volcanoes across southern Japan awakening. Pacaya and Guatemala. This is not a coincidence. This is a cycle. And when we look at the top 10 most powerful eruptions of all time, I do want to match these with grand solar minimums. When we look at the top Mount Churchill, Alaska, 674, that matches up with the late antique Little Ice Age. When we go right over to Iceland, which has become incredibly active this last week, that's the Maunder Minimum. Central America, 450, grand solar minimum. Andes, 1260. There's direct effects of the wipeout of the UN dynasty from that eruption. Tambora, year without a summer, grand solar minimum. And again, that same era, 1257, 1260 in the Andes, you got these two major eruptions that are wiping out dynasties and empires across the planet. Kuwait in Vanuatu, 452, right in the center of the Sporer minimum. Then we got Papua New Guinea right in the 535, 565. Again, this is the late antique little ice age era. Kofun era in Japan was affected. Look at Japanese history. That 674 eruption and it started right in the 550s and it lasted for 100 years. Japan was decimated. Their crops were lost and they had so much infighting. You need to take a look at that particular time period. It's not much well referenced, but it, there's a lot of information over in Japan and China about the time frame. And coming over into the last 400 years of sunspot observations, we can get a good gauge of when some of these eruptions occurred on what the solar cycles were doing at that time. Now it's very apparent and it's been confirmed by many, many, many. Even the mainstream media now is admitting that we are going into a grand solar minimum again. The drop-off in intensity of solar output also has an effect on our planet. There needs to be an electrical equilibrium, meaning that our planet is not going to stay highly charged while our sun goes into a decreased activity state electrically. They're going to start matching as they decrease, and when they do, something has to discharge, and these discharges are directly related to tectonic activity, increased porosity, and electrical storms that we're seeing terrestrially above the crust, and also volcanic eruptions. Media never wants to talk about this, so it's in your face right now. You're going to have to get ready. It's here. You're going to have to deal with it. Now, taking a look at the amount of ash that's rising into the atmosphere, the Toba supervolcano 2,800 square kilometers into the atmosphere. Mount St. Helens, just one square kilometer, but Tambora, 80 square kilometers. So between what we've just seen at Cinnabung all the way up to Tambora, we're waiting. We're right in that range of going into a major year without a summer eruption. And think about this. We've had so many anomalous weather events globally that our crops are stressed. The protein content's not the same in the wheat any longer. There's been massive wipeouts of wheat in different crops. There's crop reductions across the planet, specifically with wheat. We got all types of shortages going on. Food prices are rising already. And I really honestly don't know what's going to happen if, even if we get a full 10% or 20% reduction in global output of agriculture. How is our globe going to handle this? How is the world population going to feed itself? We are going to need a Manhattan-style project to get our agriculture revamped. Now, I don't dismiss human ingenuity in times of duress to get off of our asses and do something. It's going to take a global effort. We can still feed the population. We just need to start using alternative technologies that have been pushed into the closet. We need to get those back out, dust them off. But where's the money for all the investment going to come from? 
And what happens if we get into one of these eruptions that takes us down to 50% global reduction in our crop losses? What happens if, when we do get this next Tambora eruption that takes us with a full year without a summer, where we lose the entire global agricultural output for a year or longer? What we have in the silos is carryover stocks. That'll be sold out in seconds. There's going to be panic buying everywhere. And you really need to be aware of what's coming and what's here as a signal of what is happening right now. This is not a coincidence that all these factors are lining up. This is where it's up to you to really start preparing for yourself. This is a really nice chart here, the annual stratospheric volcanic sulfate injection. And that's exactly what we just saw with Cinnabon injection into. It was not even in the stratosphere. It was up even higher into the troposphere. This ash is going to rain out. You're going to get slight gritty ash raining out in other parts of, uh, of Southeast Asia. And when you start to look at these spikes on the chart, I'm going to put the next chart up for you. I'll let you match it up with the dates when we get into these depths of the grand solar minimums, either coming into at the depth or coming out of the low point of the grand solar minimum, these volcanic eruptions are triggered. Bring you over here again to the same chart I showed before, that whole... 550 to 650, what they called the late antique little ice age. It was a spate of eruptions that dimmed our planet and global crop losses abounded. That was another major reduction in population globally that just does not make the history books. You have to really go looking for that information. It's so far back in the past, people did just erase that 1,500 years ago. And then, of course, when we come into the 1257, that was a direct crash of the UN dynasty as well as the empires over in South America 1458 again I talked about that spore minimum and then Tambora year without a summer but all that little spate of eruptions that was in between there that's Mount Lockheed and the few others that had regional effects was decimated European crop productions 1700s eruption of Mount Lockheed you need to check that out there that's the real small eruptions between the major eruptions that happened I just want to jump back to the chart again here, most powerful eruptions of all time. How many of those are centered right over Southeast Asia going into the Pacific? And this is where the hot spot of activity is occurring right now again. It is a repeating cycle and we need to start taking a look at the solar reductions that are going to happen. Agung, that's the Bali eruption. Wait, it's happening again. Fuego. El Chinchon, Pinatubo, we start to see the volcanic eruptions and then there's a slight delay time for when the cooling happens. And what also is the wild card in all of this, the further north the eruptions happen, the more regional effect it has. So something up, let's say by Iceland, it's going to have a regional effect over in Europe. If something happens in, say, Cascadia, it's going to have a regional effect over the United States. For some reason, that ash just is not spread like it does from these more equatorial band eruptions. The ones that have the greatest effect on us globally are the equatorial band eruptions. It's just the updraft currents that pull it globally. And you can take that for what it's worth and do some more of your own research. A little more in-depth sunspot group number chart here so you can trace it through time since the 1600s. You notice that there's smaller cycles overlapping on more powerful cycles. But you can clearly see the outlier here for volcanic aerosol injection was that late 1200, early 1300s eruption. The ones over with the year without a summer are small in comparison to what happened 800 years ago. A bit closer in so you can really see how much effect larger eruptions have on our crops. All the way back to 1247 BC when that wiped out Part of the Egyptian culture, what was left of it. And we see it repeating again and again to Vesuvius in 79 AD and all the eruptions forward. And if you've made it to the end of the video here, you truly need to prepare. This scares me what happened today and yesterday. We're not ready for this. Our globe's not ready. Our societies aren't ready. Our governments aren't ready. Your, your local communities are not ready. You're going to have to get ready yourself. And if you see something on a VEI 6 or VEI 7, you literally have hours to get out to the stores because most people are going to understand when that happens, our crops are lost for the next one to two years. You have to take care of yourself, 
take care of your families. You have to understand what's going on with these volcanic eruptions and how they affect our food production. Your house is not going to get covered in ash on the other side of the planet, but your crops are going to die because it's not going to be warm enough for them to grow. I do thank you so much for watching the video. If you like this type of information, consider supporting me on PayPal or Patreon. I'll keep more information coming like this. I am incredibly dedicated to make sure that you get the latest information so you can wrap all the pieces together yourself that the mainstream media is not covering.